Good evening to those who have joined us here at the Asian Civilizations Museum and online from Facebook or YouTube Live. Welcome to today's session, Curator Talk, Behind the Scenes at ACM. I am Melissa Viswani, Senior Manager from the audience team at ACM and I will be your host for today. In ACM, we recently opened a new special exhibition, Faith, Beauty, Love, Hope, Our Stories, Your ACM, on 23rd December 2020. This exhibition is extra special because we invited ACM staff as well as stakeholders to pick their favourite artefacts to be put on display. The contributors also shared their personal insights about these artefacts and visitors can read more about them in this exhibition. Now we are going to show a short video to give you a glimpse of what this exhibition entails. The hours spent at my grandmother's old block. This puppet reminds me of those carefree days. The warm embraces, the bright laughter. Even in difficult times, I draw strength from these precious memories. Whenever things seem impossible, I remind myself of the astrolabe. It was invented by people over a millennia ago and it has more than a thousand uses. When I look at this incredible ancient device, I think of them and our wonderful connection through space and time. There's a sense of calm within each graceful line and curve, a beautiful harmony as I reflect on things that are timeless, things that last forever, I find peace within myself. Her left arm reaching back. I like to think of it as a helping hand to anyone who needs it. A reminder that we have to stand together even when we are apart. If we show each other love, then we can have hope that better things lie ahead. I'm sure all of you are intrigued to find out more about the curation of this exhibition. Today, I have with me a dear colleague and curator of Faith, Beauty, Love, Hope, Ms. Kan Shui, to share with us her experience of curating this exhibition and the behind-the-scenes stories. Shui is curator of Chinese art at the ACM. She received her BA Honours in History from the National University of Singapore and her MA in History of Art and Archaeology in East Asia in SOAS University of London. Since joining ACM in 2007, she has curated and co-curated several exhibitions at ACM. And these include The Kangxi Emperor, Treasures from the Forbidden City 2009, Terracotta Warriors, The First Emperor and His Legacy in 2011, and Joshon Korea, Court Treasures and City Life in 2017. Her latest exhibition is of course Faith, Beauty, Love, Hope, Our Stories, Your ACM. And this exhibition runs through um, 28 February 2021 in ACM. You can also submit any questions that you have on Pigeon Hole throughout the session. There will be a QR code that will be flashed for you to scan and submit your questions immediately. We are using Pigeon Hole for our on-site audience because we would like to have the safe distancing measure in place to avoid having to share mics. Those joining us online can use this code to ask any questions as well. Without any further ado, let me pass the session over to Shui. Shui, please. Thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, I know it's Friday, so thank you very much for your time. Um, I intended for this to be a rather informal kind of uh, story um, sort of share, um, sharing session. So um, my slides will actually be more pictorial heavy. I think it's suitable for Friday. So um, without further ado, I will share with you um, 
sort of the background and how sort of the story of the exhibition and how this um, actually came about. So um, maybe before you know, I commence on my first slide, I would just like to say that um, this was really an unprecedented exhibition for an unprecedented year. I think, um, as we all know, um, you know, with the pandemic, all of us have been affected in different ways. Um, it was also the same at um, the museum. And um, this is really the shortest um, exhibition gestation period that we ever had. Actually, we churned this out in a record um, about two and a half months. <laughs> So it's actually close to impossible. And I think with this sharing, um, so most of the pictures that you see I actually taken by myself. I think I only appear in one slide, <laughs> any case. Um, but it's also a kudos to the team who made this really happen. So um, it's a huge team effort. And I guess today I'm in the privileged position to talk to you maybe and share a bit, a little bit more as um, the perspective. Because usually I think the curator really walks with the exhibition from start to finish. It's really like, um, a birth, like our child coming, uh, like a child birth. Um, sorry, um, I'm not a mother, but then to us is that precious. So um, yeah, with that, let me begin. So I thought to just include this still. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has um, watched this video. It's actually available on um, online on YouTube. Um, it's a still that I sort of screen captured from this uh, black and white video, silent video. Um, called Behind the Scenes, the working site of the museum. And it's actually by the Metropolitan Museum um, in New York. So I thought that um, although this film is close to a century old, I think what is said on this slide is still very much applicable to you know, how, or, you know, how, a, how an exhibition comes about even in this day and age. Um, I think as Melissa mentioned the last time, I actually went to my special exhibition gallery and Physically install an exhibition in that particular space was actually in 2017 when I worked on the show on Korea. So um, with this very short time turnaround, I think it was a reminder that there was a lot of physical labor um, that entailed in putting an exhibition together, not just my part, but all my colleagues, as well as um, different vendors um, and other partners that we worked with. Yeah. So it's really a bit more about sharing, and uh, I just hope you find it interesting, especially if you wondered what goes on behind closed doors. Yeah, so conceptualizing the exhibition, um, as I mentioned, we were compelled to really put on our thinking hats. Um, this exhibition takes the slot of another exhibition that I was working on. It was on Ming China, and that is an international collaboration with the Palace Museum Beijing. So um, at this point, we have postponed the exhibition um, again. But actually, in 2020 itself, we moved the time, the opening date, um, three times. And until when I think the very first time we moved it, we were all you know positive that you know COVID would come and go relatively soon. But um, I think as we have seen, the reality was not the case. So when it came to a point that we knew we were not going to where you know, because when we do an international exhibition, we also um, have the staff from the institutions that we work with come to Singapore to also help us with the exhibition installation. Um, you know, there are processes like condition checks and so forth. So with basically the pandemic, it was, it, it proved to be impossible, although we tried various channels to make it happen. So with that, in a very short turnaround, um, yeah, we had to conceive of something else so I think, I mean, at the ACM, we're very used to working with um, international partners. Of course, we have, uh, even though we work with international partners, I would say these shows are mostly curated by ourselves as well. So, but since we were compelled to look inward again, I think we felt like if we had a treasures, sort of an ACM treasures exhibition, like putting our highlights again, um, it could be one way of doing so. But how do we do it a bit differently, I think was, um, you know, something that then resulted in, in this show. So um, for myself, I think when we were forced to think, okay, what, what should we do? I mean, we didn't really want it to just be like a stopgap measure. I think we wanted it to still be meaningful. And um, I think 2020 was, of course, difficult for the museum. Uh, in fact, actually having the chance to work on this exhibition, I also met some colleagues whom 
joined us during the pandemic, but I never got a chance to see. So it was really nice to be able to work with um, some of them um, and really to see people physically than just an image, you know, during your Skype or Zoom meeting. Um, and I also asked myself what a museum could mean to people or to the community in sort of at times of difficulty um, and flux. So I think whether it's time of a pandemic, I feel that a museum is really a space where hopefully you, you, know, you take yourself out of the daily grind, you have time to pause and to ponder. It's really a contemplative space. And of course, hopefully anyone who comes through our doors leave with a sense of a wonder or you know, they felt like they had an aha moment or you know, they linked or an object resonated with them. So sort of with that, um, as well as a museum being actually a civic space as well, I think we then commence on, on sort of this project or what we could do. So I have to say that because of the very tight timeline, as a curator, one of the challenges is also of putting out your text, <laughs> of writing for an exhibition and creating the content. So with a very short timeline, um, I also thought it may be best to put all our, um, like crowdsource in a way, and put all our heads together. So we thought, why not tap as well on, um, you know, basically the people around us. So I think as a curator, I am in that privileged position to be the one to conceive a narrative um, and, you know, basically show you my vision or take my interpretation of a certain th theme. So this show is different because we basically let the people we worked with um, sort of have free reign to decide what they want to put on show and what they want to tell you about that particular um, object. So it's of course undergirded by the fact, usually at the museum, we say that every object has a story to tell. Actually, each object has definitely more than one story to tell. It's about which story you want to highlight and so forth. So likewise, I think all my colleagues um, of different experiences and time at the museum also had a story to tell. And of course, the various partners we work with. Okay, I think it's not clicking now. Sorry, next slide, please. Okay, so some of the storytellers that we sort of gathered for this project, um, I mean, I just listed some of them. If you have seen the show, you would have also encountered because we put all the names um, as well and um, the designations or maybe which organizations um, they come from. And I think um, actually we said the curators would sort of take a back seat um, in, the in the show. Of course, I have to say my own favourite object is there as well as a few of the other curators. But I think very much so we wanted um, the wider, we, we often say the kampong or the village of everyone who makes the museum tick, um, also have their stories and their perspectives represented. Um, so these are all the people that you know, participated in this project. And when you go to see the show, there are about actually 60 sort of, um, slightly more than 60 physical objects um, with these stories. And if you've already been up, there is a TV monitor. So the other stories are shared digitally and you can actually take your time to read through them. So there's actually another 20 plus. So for various reasons, um, because some colleagues, for example, did select objects that are on, I would say, sort of key vistas, um, or sight lines when you sort of enter the museum. For example, the Gandharan head that you see in ancient religions that was selected by um, Barbara. Um, we, it was a bit difficult for us to move some of these objects to the space that you know we didn't want to um, leave too many gaps. Some because of conservation reasons and so forth. Um, we in the end were not able to prepare them, uh, make sure they undergo certain treatment to make them um, exhibit, exhibit ready. And I think you might be wondering, so we asked everyone to select a favorite object, but it's sort of, um, I guess the scope is really wide and expensive. So what we then sort of, um, I mean, speaking to my um, senior curator as well, then we thought to give, you know, colleagues or the other contributors beyond ACM, actually some keywords or themes that they could, you know, frame their selection. And I think, so these were actually the works that I had shared um, with them. And I think ultimately the exhibition is undergirded by the fact that we are also um, executing the project still in the time of the pandemic. 
So I think we really wanted, I think for this show, we really wanted to highlight that kind of emotional connection. So I have um, the word C there. And of course, provide visitors and as, as, as well as the contributors with a sense of, I think, hopefully they seek, they take comfort um, you know, as they contemplate on, you know, what objects or what they would like to share about themselves uh, with the audiences. Um, celebration may seem a slightly a word that's out of um, the norm, but we took it as a celebration actually of our strengths and um, really to give, I think, ourselves sort of a, a pat on the back and um, that, you know, we are doing our best um, in these rather challenging times. So it's really a celebration, I think, of humanity as well as um, personal strengths. So from there on, now you will only basically be seeing different kind of images. So all the text is um, behind us now. Um, if you've been into the gallery, uh, I started with this object because usually, I think for this, um, as I mentioned, usually if I'm a curator of a certain project, then I kind of interpret you know the theme or how what is the story that i like to tell but this time was honestly also a challenge because i wasn't sure what my colleagues were going to pick or what the other contributors so it was um we couldn't really brief our designers very much from the beginning apart from the overall concept and um part of what we do then after the what after the nominations came in um of their selected favorite object was also for myself and my colleagues from the exhibitions team to go so physically view the objects with the conservators. So actually, this is an image of the Sari Manok. If you have seen the show, you would see it. Um, and, and so for me, in, in this exhibition, I was also having a chance to work with material that actually I don't usually work with. So um, this belongs to the Southeast Asian collection. And um, so usually when we see it, we kind of have to take measurements as well and actually understand you know what where there might be perhaps structural weaknesses or discuss with the conservator yeah about the display so this is the mahjong um, table and chair set that's also on display um, and i think with big objects I, I just showed you this because this is actually um, me asking the art handlers who are now actually waiting outside while I ponder <laughs> about actually how much space this takes because part of the exhibition design is also under understanding the dimensions of the objects or how they might look. Um, although all these artifact dimensions are physically, I mean not physically, I mean are already recorded in the database, it's often quite different until you physically cite them. And this is another object that you do see in the exhibition. One, um, a very stunning and long, more than five meter long Ramayana textile. So um, yeah, again, we went to the repository at Jurong Port Road and that's the conservator who's also viewing the object together with myself. So we then discuss how do we actually go about displaying it? You know, what are potential challenges or can we even actually exhibit it in the first place? Um, yeah, so just a last image about this. So even when we look at, of course, books, I mean, them being very fragile, we then discuss with a paper conservator, um, you know, what is the angle that we can actually display the book? And then we actually take measurements of how do we design the book cradle? What page should we show? So all of this goes, I guess, into part of the um, sort of legwork into making the exhibition happen. Yeah, so this is, um, an image I captured actually from the deck, our exhibition designers, actually they, um, we also asked them to contribute a story so you can read about it in the gallery as well. Um, they are GSM projects, so this is just to give you an idea that, you know, to make the exhibition happen, a lot of it happens also on paper. Um, and you see all these numbers here, like all these red numbers, so actually all these matches the number on the artifact list so that for myself and the exhibition um, team, we essentially more for myself, just to make sure that everything flows as per how I had wanted it to and actually whether um, it works. And for this exhibition, we used many colors. This was actually a proposal from the exhibition designer. So she, our 3D exhibition designer also had to prepare like a draft like this. And here you can see, maybe when you go into the space, because it's 
as some parts is darker. You might not actually notice, but there are actually eight different shades of paint. And here she demarcated it. Um, yeah, so it's color coded and matched so that when our fabricators come, they know exactly which wall and what should be rendered. And of course, this is again for um, myself as the one having the overall oversight to make sure that it is all um, okay. Yeah, and she does a rendering like that, that you know, we often share as well to um, like our director. And um, for instance, so that they also have a visualization so that you know, it's also communicated um, across. So I just thought to also share some rendering. So this is usually what happens. The designers then, in order to put our uh, ideas, I mean, often um, we discuss with them like what, which object we would like to see first, where should it be, how should it be displayed to the public, you know, what should be highlighted and so forth. And then from there, um, they actually take it back and then they translate it. So um, this actually came from them. And I think maybe here I'll just take a moment to share, of course, that the exhibition title was really the brainchild of my museum director, Mr. Kenny Ting. Um, I think these words, I mean, although simple, but I think they are in way essential um, words that I think we, we need in this time. Um, of course, faith that things will get better. Um, and of course, I think at the museum, we often highlight, you know, about looking at beauty. Of course, beauty is the eye of the beholder, but here I think each and every object is beautiful in whoever contributed it. Um, of course, because of budget and time, um, you know, I had to group certain objects together. But for me, I felt that actually every story is equally important um, if I had um, infinite resources at my disposal. Then I actually wanted every object to be in each in its own like vitrine. So you sort of see it by itself and it's like equal. Um, but I think as part of curatorial work is to also grapple with reality. Yeah. And of course, um, we wanted to highlight the fact it's our stories and so, so your museum. So that's the other part of the title. Yeah, so these are some of the other renderings um, that you can see. And if you have a good eye or you remember the exhibition quite well, there's a spot the difference. One object is actually not where it is now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so these are some of the other renderings. So actually for the exhibition designer's work is also very grueling. They actually I've only sort of extracted a few, but they actually have to do it at multiple um, angles sort of to show us, for us to also approve the drawings to proceed. Yeah, so here there's actually also a slight change. Um, I didn't emphasize the one before, but here is, if you have seen the exhibition and might remember, there's actually been a swap of positions for this patchwork coat where the showcase uh, shadow boxes as well as where the two paintings are. So sometimes on paper it looks okay, but when we physically go to the space, then we realize that, oh, there's actually like a, a temperature control somewhere. There is an emergency button, like, and so forth. And then we then have to sort of recalibrate. Although it's supposed to be our familiar space, but because of the pandemic, we were also not able to go on site um, that often as well to check some of these things that used to be very easy to do. And here I wanted to share, um, Another thing that we thought would be important to develop in this exhibition, which is also for your stories to be shared with other visitors as well, and, um, and a platform for you to also reflect. So this was something we came up with. This is, yeah, us from the deck when we were preparing. So it's all, um, yeah, it's all sort of nonsense text now. It's all um, placement text. Yeah, so, I mean, we had a few designs to see how this works, like how much text we can allow people to, you know, to input. I don't know if you have tried it, but it's actually Twitter length. So we thought this should be a, I guess, a familiar and an okay length for people to share. Yeah, and of course, this is actually how it works. So if you haven't, we welcome you to also share your story. You just have to scan the QR code and this appears um, as a library of images. Yeah, and they, okay, they used, that's actually my favorite object, and they used that when to show us the template. So building the exhibition, um, sorry, so really as the curator as well in the exhibition team, we see a lot of drawings like this, and there's like a lot of numbers to also try to get our heads around. Um, and this is similar to, I think, what you saw, 
but it's also for us to identify actually potentially how much but how much money we might be spending. So it's color coded here um, to talk about you know what are the new showcases that we need to fabricate. Uh, for example, this is actually for the big satellite tile panel that you see um, because that is also a relatively new acquisition. It's it's just come into the museum and not on display before. So things like that, that are really more unique, we need to sort of customize. Yeah, and of course, even the platforms that you see, for example, where the Sari Manat was and so forth. Yeah, so this gives us a good bird's eye view, but it's sort of necessary as part of the exhibition um, design. And then we have uh, like a huge stack of elevation drawings like this. Yeah, sorry, it was a bit nitty gritty, but I thought maybe it might be interesting for some of us to see. Yeah, so basically everything is in MM and yeah, everything is sort of drawn accurately. So we actually physically go down to mark the space, see is there enough um, room for wheelchair access and so forth. And yeah, so it's all part of the project. Yeah, so this is actually, um, if you may recognize this, this is actually where that masthead was, Faith, Beauty, Love, Hope. And actually this is where the big lacquer chest is. So this is like a profile view. Yeah, so if you look at it on this from the exhibition space. So we have pages of this to go through <laughs> as well. Um, and of course, my 3D designer is the busiest one then churning out these various drawings so that the people who fabricate it will do it as to our specifications. Yeah, so this is for the Safavit tile panel that I mentioned. Yeah, so of course, not just the dimensions, but the type of finishing, how it should be accessed, um, so, and where the caption should go. So all of this, it basically needs to be part of the sort of um, process. Okay, so this is then photos I had taken um, of some of the, pro you know, some of it where I could have a moment to take my phone out to snap something. Uh, so it's not all comprehensive, but I guess you will never see a shot like this. We will never allow the, a visitor to see it. So this is really very behind the scenes. And um, actually even building like an exhibition masthead. Yeah, this is the first time that actually I think we've tried it with, with light. So we also tested what kind of light, whether it works better with a white light or a yellow light. And then we had different kind of LED strips. So this is like the final where we thought, OK, the color looks good. And here in the exhibition, when you see there's actually been a mesh yeah, applied in, in front of it. So it has that translucent um, effect because this also comes to um, something that my um, museum director wanted. Um, he he didn't have, I mean, he, want, he, he definitely trusted our exhibition designers, but he had something that he wanted them to fulfill, which is he wanted the exhibition to have a kind of cinematic quality. Yeah, so, um, and, and so this was sort of what transpired between sort of the look for this exhibition as well. And um, I know the gallery is much darker now, but of course, when we're putting up the exhibition, here we have, um, the house lights on, yeah, so it's much brighter, but also I thought this would be fun for you to actually see the color gradation because when we were also conceiving the exhibition to have a kind of more lush quality to it, then the designer suggested to use a spectrum of colors. So you come into a darker space and hopefully as you um, wandered through the exhibition and then when you exit, you sort of, you know, it's a brighter space and hopefully your mood is also more uplifted. So I think, I think with this photo, you can see that there was definitely a gradation of colors. Yeah, and these are pillars, uh, oh sorry, co yeah, pillars, columns that actually for every time we design an exhibition, we have to deal with since this is a preserved monument. Yeah, it works. But it's also sometimes a challenge. We always have to build around it. And this is, um, yeah, so there's really a lot of manual labor and these are actually um, some of our fabricators and vendors yeah, trying to put up, you know, these screens that you see that demarcate our space. Um, yeah, making sure that they're all hang hanging straight um, and so forth, no creases. And this is, yeah, this girl here, <laughs> that's um, my graphics um, designer. She's also from GSM Project, so um, she's there to direct all these work as well. And so um, this was the story wall. And you might be wondering what we're doing here. Perhaps you would never realize, but we actually painted a white rectangle behind this 
um, projection so that the colour comes out more accurate than if it was projected against like an orange. So here we are measuring it to make sure that we have the size of also what we programmed it for and um, um, and to make sure like you know everything is actually as straight as it, it can be. So just lots of nitty gritty um, work. Yeah, so that's yeah, Suying and Lowry both um, from GSM projects who helped us with the exhibition design. Yeah, and of course we need to use equipment like this, like um, laser to also uh, we use it very much to make sure everything is aligned because we while we do trust our naked eye, um, I guess to ninety ninety five percent. Yeah, we personally I do want to make sure that everything is also as accurate as possible. So we use tools like this, and um, yeah, some of the images I'm installing that might be then also I think interesting. Yeah, so this is actually the mother of Pearl Door that first greets you when you enter the exhibition. And yeah, it actually took so many people <laughs> yeah, to put this door up. Um, it's actually on a slightly raised platform, if you see it. Um, I think it's, I mean, I, I did specifically ask for it to be placed there so it sort of welcomes you into another space and that it could be a visual anchor for this space as well. Um, I thought it might be fun for you actually to see the reverse because most um, people wouldn't get a chance to see other perspectives of an object that um, we do. So it's actually really plain on the other side, yeah, like this. Um, of course, the front is very ostentatious. We don't actually know um, what, what was the original structure that housed these pair of doors. Um, but yes, this was a number of people who were trying to uh, make sure that it is actually um, centralized on the plin and usually as a curator we do a bit less physical lifting <laughs> yeah I, I just need to make sure that everything is central and everything so the rest of um, my exhibitions team who are on the ladder as well as the art handlers uh, often have the tougher time <laughs> yeah of um, supporting objects or moving objects but we really try to minimize that as well so for the safety so this is an image of, um, of the Sethid tile panel and so this for us was like a new challenge um, it was a new acquisition and in its original context like a like a tile panel like this would have been displayed um, vertically yeah on a, on a wall so but with this very short time frame um, our conservators didn't have enough time to help us um, sort of we yet hear some of the broken fragments and to make sure that it was structurally sound enough again to be displayed in such a way. So we had to think what we could do. And um, myself and my exhibition manager for this show, Easy, Easy Kill, um, we came up with this kind of support structure. So we actually ordered a very big shell thing. Actually now when you see it, you, pro it's, you try to make it close to impossible. So it's, uh, I mean, cl sorry, close to invisible so that it's flush is slightly smaller than the tiles, um, but we needed it to actually support each row of the tiles. Oh, sorry, there's actually 45 tiles. And here we were trying out actually in at uh, HEC, our repository, uh, and discussing it with our objects conservator to see if it's actually okay. So you can see that there are actually fragmentary pieces. And then we were thinking how to support it so that structurally it causes as little, you know, uh, we didn't want to cause, of course, any further um, breakages or anything like this. So for us, of course, the safety of the object is um, pri the priority. Yeah, and so this was actually how it is installed, uh, or rather during the installation. Uh, if you remember, then, uh, the earlier drawing was actually done on a slope. So we even have to determine how steep the slope can be with the objects conservator. We brought the entire structure down to actually test the angles with just a few tiles to see also visually how it would look like and so forth. So, um, um, yeah, in the end, so you can see this is actually how the tiles are being laid and we actually put sort of black foam beneath all of it because the tiles are also irregular. Yeah, so it was, how do we shift it? Yeah, and this was something that I asked for. So I asked for a one-for-one -one mock up basically to be printed so that, you know, once so that we could also match the positions of everything and to also note we know which tile is extra fragile so that we can take note of it during installation. Yep. And so this was the other big object. So just now you saw the Ramayana textile or 
unrolled in the conservation and again, again, lots of manual um, labor and manpower required yeah, to install this very big um, textile. Yeah, all, all of them trying the best to make sure that it's aligned here. And yeah, I mentioned cons our conservators a few times. And in fact, they are, of course, really the ones who, I mean, sometimes they do come down. And for instance, in the case of this Ramayana textile, um, our textiles conservator, uh, Miki, that's her, and um, another colleague here, sorry, that she, yeah, she was actually our main textiles um, conservator in charge of this exhibition. But so both of them came down to actually help us to actually, um, actually behind this textile, there's actually a strip of Velcro that has been stitched onto a piece of cotton calico, and then that is then st stitched um, onto this object. Yeah, so they're actually helping us to align the entire textile on this um, so-called padded um, strainer board. Yeah, so they're helping us to make sure and um, yeah, it's definitely in good hands there. And here are some of my other colleagues that you see, so lots of stretching um, required. Here, I don't know if you can see, there's actually one person in here. So this is actually, <laughs> yeah, in here. This is my colleague, Hyro. Um, yeah, so he's one of the colleagues I did mention who only joined us during the pandemic. So it was nice to be able to see them in person and work with them yeah, on site as well. So actually for what happened for this show, um, in the museum, we are still working on a split team arrangement. So we created a sort of a team that was essentially in a bubble. We couldn't go anywhere else apart from a few places in the museum during the two weeks of installation. So it allowed both team A and B colleagues to come together. Yeah, anyway, he's here. He's actually fixing up the lights for so-called my favorite object, the lacquer screen. Um, yeah, I think I made them work very hard. Not because it's my favorite object, but because it's actually really quite hard to light the object. Um, this is Hanafi, uh, one of our veteran colleagues at the museum. And he, I don't know if you recognize this case, but this is actually for the Hong Bo, yeah, which we actually had to adjust the lighting actually several times. Um, we in the end had to install like so-called fiber optics to get the sights as well. And we were joking that it was looking like a stadium, like kind of stadium lights, and it was looking like a Super Bowl. Okay, never mind if you don't get that, but <laughs> um, here, this is uh, an object um, as well. Not sure if you can recognize it between the hands. Yeah, this is um, the sort of seated Buddha. Yes, with the Naga en um, enthroned, Naga enthroned Buddha. And again, lots of men required actually to move sort of sculptures like this. This is usually in our permanent gallery, so uh, already there's less lifting. But yeah, we require, of course, a lot of equipment like this, like a stacker, as well as a pallet, so that we can raise the object really to the height of its display case, so that there's really as minimal sort of uh, danger to the object as, as possible. Yes, and of course, with our very high ceilings, we are close to eight meters in our special exhibitions, obviously all around um, level two galleries, yeah, we have uh, my colleague Idris here, another veteran at the museum. Yeah, and he is, of course, I think um, I've actually personally never gone up this high myself, but for every exhibition, he goes up multiple, multiple times. Every time I say this needs to be brighter, the light needs to shift, this needs to be at a certain angle, he has to go up. <laughs> and it's actually really tiring for them. But um, yeah, so he goes up this like a cherry picker, um, on this like hydraulic platform and he goes and adjusts all the lights that we have. So um, I think most of us don't really look at the ceiling, but this is kind of the work that has to be done as well. And I have um, two other dear colleagues, um, Shika here. She's our younger mounter. She's been with us, I think at least five, maybe at least four, four years. Um, and then Maslan who has been actually with us even before there was ACM or even I think NHB as well, really veteran colleague. Um, and he's like our master mounter. And so they are all making the mounts. He's actually working on the mount for the Wayang Toping mask that you can see in the exhibition. And then she, Shika here is working on actually the jewelry display. Yeah, so she would, basically I would discuss with her or how I would want the objects to look. And then they often, very cleverly designed a mount for the object so that it could be raised up or it could be presented in its best way possible. Of course, um, 
balancing the security and the safety of the object as well as aesthetics. Yes. So, um, yeah, Shika here ready on hand to help Maslan, who's drilling a mount for one of the dishes. I think this is um, for our director Kenny's pick, which is a porcelain white dish. And I'm not sure if you ever look closely at the mounts in, in display. So this is actually the Sari Manok. And we often try to also conceal our mounts to make it look more seamless. And Shika is actually touching up and painting the mount here so that it looks to be of a similar shade as the object. Okay, so this is the only um, picture where I appear. Sorry, not a very glam photo. This is actually me. And well, the curators, I'm not sure whether all curators do the same, but um, I guess I, I do like to be quite hands-on. And so because... Um, with time not on our side, I was also installing the captions here with another of my colleague from exhibitions, Jinika. Yeah, and we we're making sure all the captions are looking level when you see them. So this is with a leveler as well as a laser. This is my exhibitions designer and she's also quite a perfectionist. So she's actually adjusting all the text that we have that the vendor helped us to apply on the platform. She is like taking them out and making sure they are straight. <laughs> Yes, so just a little bit, um, just sort of the last part before we sort of head into Q&A. Um, a few more slides are just about the objects, which I thought to share, I think some of the perspectives of it that you don't get to see when you're in the gallery. So this is the first object that greets you. This is the um, Japanese lacquer, lacquer chest. Um, of course, we often grapple with whether we want to show objects opened or closed because it's on open display, this particular object. We think, of course, for the safety of it, and we do not want anyone to be touching it or lifting it like this. So I'm just allowing you sort of a, a, a glimpse as well. And actually, it's also really magnificent um, inside. I think part of the show, um, I mean, part of the thinking for how I chose to display some objects was to also show you other perspectives of it. Um, that you don't get to see, even though this object is also in the permanent gallery now, Maritime Trade Gallery, um, on a you know on any other day. But in that in that same space, you only sort of see the front, and I think a little bit of this side. Yeah. So this time you get to walk around it. Unfortunately, I could not show the inside, but here I'm um, showing you actually that it's also very exquisitely like painted. Yeah, with cranes and leaves, like an op autumnal scene inside. And then this is just another zoom in um, so that you can sort of see it better. Actually, a very lovely scene as well. But, uh, well, we'd like you to focus on, on the outside. And I think for this exhibition, while the objects are important, really the stories of how my colleagues or why they chose them and connected with them is equally, if not more, important. Uh, this is the Sari Manau again, yes. And... Um, so it's really quite glorious. I think we made sure that the light on it was dramatic. Uh, when we came, uh, when it came to us, um, sorry, this packaging is uh, looks a little bit more, a little bit more makeshift, I have to say. Yeah, because this came to us uh, from our repository, but of course it was very safely packed. But yeah, for an object like this that has you know many parts and some parts are not detachable. Yeah, it comes. I thought it, it might be f fun for you to see that it. You know, the, the kind of packaging that was done. So it came in a very big box, yeah, and a pallet that's more than 1.5 meters. And then this was, yeah, when we first installed it, yeah, because we want, before we decide on the exact position, we usually try to visualize the object in the space as well. Like, do I actually have to tilt it a little bit more? How does it look? Do I have to make it, you know, move forward a little bit? Yeah, as much as we want to, to do it as a one shot, one kill, to put it there, we often still need to make some minor adjustments. Yeah, so um, this is before it's all unwrapped. And um, this sapesh, you might have also seen it upstairs. And I thought it would be fun to show you the reverse side. So I was reminded by my colleague Naomi, who selected this object. She's also the curator of the jewelry gallery. And um, in her write-up, she talked about, you know, the enamel side. So this is actually the reverse side. So just now was the front of the object, yeah, um, with the white sapphires. And actually on the reverse, 
um, they are all individually enamored with these like um, beautiful pink flowers. So maybe lotuses, um, I'm not sure specifically, but very, you know, exquisitely painted. So it was because of that that I sort of conceived the display that you sort of see there, which is with like a, th a threefold um, mirror. So thankfully it worked. And um, this might be fun too. So um, when this object came into the collection, when it was acquired, it actually came with a box like a customized box for it. So it's really done to its fit. And the, what a wonderful story, although it looks relatively grubby. Um, on the reverse of the cover, there's actually an old news, I think it's a newspaper from the Gazette of India, and it's dated 1887. So the date's actually here. So the box, of course, has a pretty lovely history as well. The object itself might predated it slightly. And... Um, another object that you see, the hot pot. And of course, again, when you see it, we have displayed it with its lid on in its entirety. Um, and I thought it might be fun for you to also see what goes under or what's inside the receptacle. So this is unlidded. And um, this is a, a painted enamel on a copper uh, vessel. And actually on each side, there are a pair of fishes. Yeah, so I've extracted, you know, um, a close-up of, of two of the sites to show you uh, like a wonderful kind of aquatic scene that you can see. I, I, we don't know who, who originally owned this, but maybe before they used it was kind of a rather delightful, yeah, before there were bubbling ingredients. Yeah, and I think with that I'm about um, just on time, hopefully for Q&A. And yeah, and so this I thought to end, yeah, with a scene actually of us putting up um, Yes, our sort of riverside facade. Yeah, we were working on a rainy day <laughs> yeah, when they were installing this. So yeah, with that, thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'll hand over the time to Mel again. Thank you, Shui, for such an insightful sharing. I think I learned a lot about the curation of this exhibition. And now, are you ready to answer some questions? Um, yes. Okay, yes. so we do have some questions that have come through uh, via uh, Pigeon Hole. So uh, this question asked by TS, what was the most surprising object chosen by staff for the exhibition, which left an impression on you? Oh, by staff. Can I choose other beyond okay, staff? Sure. Yes, of <laughs> course. <laughs> oh, okay. I think for me, and it might be for visitors as well, is probably the yellow rubber ducky. Um, in part because it was also selected by a longtime docent um, at the ACM. I think since I joined in 07, or I mean, I've definitely seen her being very active at the museum for a long time. So I believe she's very familiar with the collection. And I thought perhaps she might select something older or more dramatic. But um, well, she selected something quirky, and I think um, everyone looks at it, you know, in a different way now that it's again on display. It used to be in the Singapore River Gallery, but after that was deinstalled, um, I think the duck has been sort of lying, you know, at at, at rest <laughs> for several years now. So I think it's a fun object, and I think, um, yeah, I think for Joe, I've seen her, you know, guide at the museum. She's often very animated. So I think it's. Well, perhaps something that suits her personality, but um, yeah, I thought it was rather actually unusual, mm, a, a pick, yes. But I think many people end up looking at it because actually we have put it on the yellow wall. Yeah, so it sort of blends and it's a nice pop of color, I think. Yes, Joe is one of our most experienced uh, student guides. And, uh, and I think she did mention to me that the rubber ducky is one of her favorite objects uh -oh. to guide. So I'm glad she chose that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's go to the next question that we have. Mm -hmm. um, what are the demographics of the contributors? And was this taken into consideration uh, to ensure diverse community or ethnic groups are represented? OK, um, I think we I think it's relatively diverse. Um, I think the colleagues who work in the museum are also relatively diverse. We, um, you know, our colleagues from different ethnic groups as well, and of course, of different um, ages. Um, so 
like just Shika and Maslan. I'm not sure if they really want me to review their ages, but they are at least more than three decades apart in, in age, for, for instance. Um, and of course, we also wanted to um, reach out to various people that we worked with. So for example, um, students, I think we have from primary school students up to um, pre-university I mean, pre university JC students, for instance. Um, and I think we wanted it to be as diverse in a way as possible. So, I mean, through some of our other colleagues, we also reached out to staff who were working in the museum shop, in the restaurants, um, our security team as well. So actually, they are not um, really part of ACM. They are sort of other vendors that, you know, we work with um, at the museum. But I think in a way, they are also familiar with ACM and they probably, you know, have spent a lot of time here as well. So I think we wanted sort of different perspectives and also a chance for it to be a really more inclusive show. Yeah, I think as mentioned, often, I mean, the curator gets gets the voice, the loudest voice to be heard. But I think in this year, I think we're, especially we're all more socially distant, it would be a good time that, you know, the people who make the museum tick can then be celebrated as well. Definitely. <laughs> so um, leading on, uh, mo moving from that comment, uh, there's this uh, question um, that came through, uh, which started, I love the exhibition, okay, so yay. Thank you. <laughs> Might this be a new way forward, um, um, collaborative approaches to curating an exhibition? Okay, I think um, collabor and like collaborative efforts, I mean, are not novel. Um, I mean, in my time at the museum, uh, perhaps for the projects I worked on, they may not have been sort of collaborative to this extent, but definitely, for example, at the Pranaka Museum, um, we definitely have had past exhibitions where, you know, we, we invited the Pranakan community to also, um, you know, choose objects and, you know, there's a more co-curation going on. So I think it's definitely, I think, possible, depending on the theme of the exhibition. I think for this show, of course, it's very much people oriented and I think about, as I said, about emotions and a kind of more personal touch. So I think for this, it, it is, it is a must to be collaborative. Yeah, and I think definitely collaboration comes on different levels. So of course we hope that, you know, the museum will continue to be one. Yeah, although maybe the extent of collaboration, it might differ from project to project. And uh, yes, I think uh, we have this question here, which you may have addressed a bit of okay. during your presentation. Uh, interesting look and photos behind the scenes. Any unprecedented, uh, Precedented challenges putting up the show in COVID times. Right. Um, I think, yeah, briefly mentioned was, of course, being, um, I mean, even when I was conceiving the exhibition, I was also still, you know, I could not come to the museum every, every day and so forth. So that definitely still puts um, sort of a bit of a, like a bit of a hamper in terms of moving the time, timeline um, forward. Um, and I think, it was also difficult for, I mean, usually in exhibition, there's many partners involved. Uh, I did not mention um, ev everybody really involved um, in the project. Um, so I think it's harder for people to come down to physically check certain things or even for us to physically access the objects. We had to do it on multiple visits, like only on the Thursday or Friday that I could go down uh, to the conservation, conservation center, for instance. So I think, um, on hindsight, it was really a miracle that we managed to pull the exhibition. I think I've also mentioned it was commitment on the on many on yeah on many partners yeah to really make it happen. So yeah, I think mm, I think it was sort of a bit of time and that physical excess now. So, mm. Okay, um, the next part. What's your favorite part of opening a show? the curating of objects, writing of labels, or? Oh, <laughs> um, I think the favorite part, I think actually is really in the end, the final installation is sort of like when everything comes together um, and then when we finally get to open it. So it's usually very text, like physically texting. We really keep very long hours actually in, in the gallery. Um, because there's always something that, oh, you didn't, you might have overlooked or you want to improve of it when you're on, on site as well. Yeah, so I think the favourite part really is in the installation where, especially if we work with international um, sort of collaborators as well, um, because 
often we don't get a physical access to many of the objects. Um, we might have selected it from their catalog or from discussion with their curators and so forth. So it's really the installation where you come, when you sort of see everything in the flesh and then um, at, at least as the curators or for at least our own exhibits, we get to handle them and really put it up. So I think that's often the, the best part of it. Of course, everything is, um, has enjoyable parts as well, but I think really when we're at the last sort of uh, the final phase of the race is yeah, the most rewarding, I think. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, there's a question about uh, exhibition designers because, as you mentioned, they play a very important role in uh, um, making, uh, making the exhibition materialize. Mm -hmm. um, what role do the exhibition designers have in helping to select or curate the objects for display so as to make it more visually balanced or exciting? Right. Um, I think the exhibition designers actually still take the cue from the curators. Yeah, so they usually it's about me communicating what I would like to them and um, and them also then trying to, um, I think maybe different curators also work on different levels. Personally, I'm really quite hands-on, so I even go to the extent of designing the plins and everything and so forth myself. Yeah, so... I mean, my designer does it, but then I would also check and then I will adjust it if I think it doesn't work or I'll discuss with her and so forth. So um, I think in terms of selection and everything, it's very much ultimately the decision lies with more or less the curator. They will give recommendations perhaps that maybe certain things work, but um, at least for myself, I think I have quite a strong voice to determine how I would like certain things to be. Um, at certain places la. and of course they try their best to make it happen but if there are defi definite limitations which they often are then we would discuss and work out what would be the best solution mm. so there's a lot of discussion that takes place before the exhibition is finally put up for everyone to enjoy yes so even with some of the plans that i showed where it's really sort of drawn it's already after many rounds of revision so that the, the, the images i showed is actually from the final deck so there's many decks dated from yeah, many parts of it. So it's, and even on the ground, sometimes I may have said that, oh, I wanted this to be a certain height, a certain width and depth. And then I come and I realize that it actually doesn't work so well. And then we still have to make adjustments on the ground itself. Yeah. So I think part of the fun of it as well. So, um, but yeah, usually I think at least with the designers I had worked with, they would still take the cue from myself and we try our best to work out. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so we will go to one more question here. Um, you mentioned, as we know on, in the exhibition, your, uh, the picked object from you was the lacquer screen. Mm -hmm. So did you discover any new favourite objects through this exhibition? Oh, okay. Um, I think... Yeah, some of the objects I didn't have a chance to also see in person because they are sort of under other collection areas. Uh, definitely, I think the sapesh, which I, sh which I showed, yeah, the turban ornament. Um, I think with this exhibition, I had a chance to handle it in person to actually really see the size and you know how exquisite it was. So I think with that, it also gave me the idea to display it in the way that I did with, with like a mirror. So actually the exhibition designer, when I told her that I wanted to show the reverse, the initial design was just a just a one like one piece mirror. So I said maybe if we have a three four it might look more dramatic. Yeah. And so we left it as that because we had a very tight time frame. So it was really on the ground. Then I told my exhibition manager, Easy, and then I drew it out for him and I said, Can we make this happen? So actually I wanted a mirror that was like hinged like so that it folded and I could adjust the angle. But again with the tight time if you remember it, it's now actually three separate pieces, like three slabs. So it was actually easier to manufacture. And then after it came, we then adjusted the angle and we sort of fastened it in a different way. Yeah, so I think we also have to adapt. But that was definitely one object that I think was a new, fav new favourite. And I think another one is actually the kabaya. Yeah, I do remember it from the Peranakan Museum days, but it was quite nice that my colleague Jessica selected it. Um, and for me, it was also fun because as sort of the overall curator in charge, I actually got to read all the stories that came in. And then I learned that she actually used to be working for SIA. And why she chose a kabaya was also because it reminded of her time, you know, when she was in the air and how the kabaya meant a lot to her, like her own uniform. 
yeah so i think that that piece is very fun and i think everyone will connect to it with its really whimsical motives yeah yes for sure <laughs> for sure all right shui thank you so much thank you it's it has been a delightful evening listen to all listening to all the interesting stories behind the scenes uh, um you know uh, putting together the faith beauty love hope exhibition thank you shui for this and to all of you, I hope you had an enjoyable evening. And if you haven't gone to this special exhibition to see the sapesh and the kabaya, the lacquer screen, and so many more objects and read all the different stories, um, I hope you will make your way up to the ex special exhibition. And we do have some other programs this evening and coming up as well in February on the 6th, uh, 19th and 27th of February. Please uh, keep a lookout on the ACM website as well as the uh, ACM social media platforms. And we hope to see you for these uh, for these various uh, programs. And uh, we would really appreciate if you could give us your feedback as well. And I believe we do have uh, the QR code scanned here. Uh, please do leave us your feedback um, so that we can uh, further improve our programs in the future. And uh, yes, that's all from me. Uh, thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you back at the museum again. Thank you. <laughs>